Hi everyone, welcome back to another podcast. I am very happy to share with you a special guest today, someone whose career has spanned from the 1950s until present day and very recently was in a film which won multiple awards. How many people can say that they're doing that in their 80s? My special guest is actor Darren Nesbitt. Now, a lot of you will know Darren for his very famous role in Where Eagles Dare. I really got to know his work over lockdown because you may not realise it, but Darren has been in so many different films and made so many appearances in programmes that you'll know. you probably recognise him straight away. You might also know him for a series that he did in the 70s called Special Branch. And if you don't know it, I thoroughly recommend you check it out because you'll realise that it was the inspiration for so many cop shows, detective shows, that style of drama. From then on, you can really see the inspiration. There are also a few things that I wanted to ask Darren that I'll save for you listening to the podcast. But if I just say names such as Clint Eastwood, Frank Sinatra, Richard Burton, Mary Ewer, Eutha Joyce, Glenn Edwards, Francois Pascal, Tony Curtis, Roger Moore, Robert Vaughan. The list goes on. Darren has worked with so many names and he is right up there in his acting ability. So much so that Darren is also Chief Executive of New Era Academy, which is a performing arts school which focuses on drama voice, performance and communication skills for young people, really building up their confidence. So I wanted to speak to Darren about exactly what New Era Academy involves and having someone such as him involved You know, there's not many schools that can actually claim to have a chief executive of that stature. So we started off with that in our chat. And then we got the chance to really discuss some of his most memorable and iconic roles. And he also shared some fabulous stories. So I hope you enjoy our chat. It's so nice to speak to you, first of all. Um, I would like to say that you have been a massive part of our family's lockdown. Every, <laughs> it just seemed as if um, last year we got into a lot of talking pictures, which I've always loved anyway. Yeah. Um, and I watched a lot more of the, the classics, if you like, and also the television programmes that I'd always meant to watch. Yes. But you always end up, you just don't have the time. So you became a huge part of our lockdown because we were watching all the classics and you popped up quite a lot in a lot of these programmes. And <laughs> well, you know that so many people think what you do is brilliant anyway, that um, I just thought when I Googled what I hadn't seen of yours, and there was a list of films and I thought, right, I have to make sure that I work my way through these films. That's when I discovered New Era Academy. And I thought, that's fantastic because there can't be a lot of people with your knowledge and your experience that are yes, actually working with people in that way. So would you be happy to chat me through what the Academy does? Yeah, of course, absolutely. I mean, um, we uh, we took over, I think, about nine nine nine, 10, 12 years ago. And we've increased the uh, turnover about 250%. Wow. It, it's, it's just, um, you know, it's, it's great to be able to offer uh, a whole range of exams to, to children and to, uh, I mean, teenagers as well. And it gives me great um, pleasure you know, to reorganize the company and, and to get it on a proper footing because I've always been involved in companies. I mean, my brother and I started a company called Our Price Records. Which, Who doesn't know Our Price? Yeah, well, wow. I, started it, I started it with my little brother. Wow. And so, you no, know, I mean, I've always been interested in that. In fact, uh, and then I, I, I had one of the biggest uh, theater ticket agencies as well. But uh, New Era Academy is something that 
that I love. And Miranda <laughs> is absolutely brilliant. I mean, she is amazing. I mean, what she's done is, well, I'm flabbergasted daily. You know, she's so great with people. You know, for instance, some of the other academies, or rather, you know, drama exam boards, you can't speak to the person you need. Mm -hmm. You know, you go through various people. But Miranda, you can always speak to Miranda directly or to Holly or to Tina. Uh, who are the, you know, the, the main springs of the company. I, that sounds like the, the most progressive way to run a company nowadays is just to be approachable, be available. Oh, yeah. that, do you complement each other's skills perfectly well, then? Yeah, yeah I, I do believe so. Uh, because it's most important that one is there for the teachers, just as the teachers are there for their students, mm -hmm. we are there for for them. And oh, this good. has been this has been our our mainstay, and and uh, is to be so approachable. You know, our competitors maybe are not quite so. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you say, lead by example. You said you were the first to take yeah. your courses Absolutely. online. Absolutely. And of course, uh, some of the others have followed. And also there was another thing too, which was Ofqual, because we're regulated by Ofqual. Mm -hmm. And Ofqual came along and they said now group exams can no longer be regulated. They said that they can't be regulated. And why is mm -hmm. that, I asked. And that they said, well, then every student must have their own report and their own certificate. Well, now, if you're doing a group exam, uh, that's why it cannot be regulated, because you can't do that. So yes. I, because I know so much about film, I immediately went in and said, right, well, what we can do is we can make these exams regulated by filming them so Brilliant. that the examiner can re-see, re-look at all the different students and can give them individual report forms and certificates. And also they can also be in different grades. I think one or two of our competitors have started to do that as well. Mm. I think so that, that says a lot. Followed. <laughs> that, but it's well, that's a compliment. Yeah. And um, yeah. do you feel that that might be the way forward, sometimes they say that the, the best innovation can happen by accident. So do you think that's actually a good way to move forward? Well, I do believe it, it is, because I think that when the shutdown actually finishes, there will be a lot of online exams, financially as well. Because mm -hmm. if you look at, at the, oh, by the way, we, free, we froze our fees uh, for the year um, because people who might have difficulty economically because of the shutdown. I think we were mm -hmm. the only exam board who actually froze the fees. It sounds as if because of your career, you really do understand the other side of things. Do you think that's what makes you different is that you've actually, you've lived the other side of it. You've not just come into it as the oh, yeah. sort of, um, you know, some people are purely the academic side because you've lived on the other side of it. Is that why you're trying so hard to be helpful to everybody that's well, trying to I, learn these skills yeah i do believe so i think that it, you know it does help because you know the the children and i you know say to the examiners when we used to do face to face remember those children they're standing there on their own mummy and daddy are not there this is the first time and they will remember this for the rest of their lives and you are not so much an examiner as a helper, you know, you must try and bring them out, not just to have a cold exam. That is no way. You encourage, you, you, you know, unless that child leaves the exam and says, oh, I really, I want to do another exam, then the examiner has failed. Right. That makes sense. I never thought of it that way. You're right. It should be a guide. Yeah. And talking, going back again, saying about online in the future, uh, we see we do the fees for, you know, the United Kingdom face to face. Now, in Hong Kong, which we do um, very big in Hong Kong, 
the fees must go up because you've got to pay for the examiner, the airfare, the hotel, mm -hmm. the foods, the expenses. Well, online, you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. And so the fees are remarkably lower. And also, we're now in partnership with a huge Chinese company. Um, I think they've got 200,000 schools. Wow. Um, <laughs> yes, wow. <laughs> and so we, we are helping them uh, to enter into this, into the, the field of, of, you know, United Kingdom uh, drama exams, which is exciting, which is very nice. So if anyone wanted to know more about New Era, I know that you've got a website for the Academy. In a few sentences, who would you say it's for? Like you said about the children, so is there a specific age group that it caters to and, and does it help? Well, whatever. No, that's good. You know, from the very toddlers uh -huh. who tend to cry. <laughs> you know, occasionally, you know, occasionally you get the little girl or the little boy who stands there and just cries. Overwhelmed. And so, and then, and then, and then, then you know, you take them to one side, and and you know, you have a little chat, and then uh, you encourage them, and then a little by little, and then it's wonderful because you see them blossom, which is which is nice, which is nice. Oh, that's good. And does that go all the way up to like, teenagers that are really serious about progressing with their acting? Oh, oh yes. I mean, it goes right up to uh, teenagers. I think also I brought in Shakespeare, which. Um, um, I don't think the others did, uh, which I think was rather strange, because when I was at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, I won the uh, highest acting award and the highest Shakespeare award. I don't think anybody ever did that before. So Shakespeare's been a great love. That's fantastic. And not being an actor or actress myself, I never know whether to say actor or actress. That's a hot topic. Some people know, want to be called an actor, but then I've heard, I, I might be wrong, it might have been Joan Collins that was interviewed and they called her an actor and she said, I'm an actress. So I never know what to refer to now. So I always <laughs> actress and actor because... Yes, you know. I think, and we all know what we mean, but not exactly. being... Like, yeah, but you can offend people so easily. <laughs> but, well, I've been um, around so long. I started it, you know, doing actor and actress, and these newcomers who come in and change things, you know. Yes, and it, it confuses us all. We don't know, <laughs> but we know no. what we mean, as long as we're not trying to offend. But um, not being, not having any acting experience, it doesn't surprise me when you say that you won those awards because watching you, and again, when you don't have any acting experience, when you watch someone like yourself who makes it look so easy and we're just drawn into the characters, that must be such a compliment to you for us all to still appreciate your work because I want to talk to you about Tucked as well because that oh, yeah. was brilliant. I watched yeah. that recently, it was fantastic. But it makes you realise the skills that someone's got when you can yeah. actually watch them do all different sorts of parts. And then sometimes I do watch things and I realize that there are some people who, again, not to take anything away from them, but they are always the same person, just in yeah. a different show. And then I realize, oh, there actually is, there's real skill to this. I think we take it for granted. We just are entertained by you and we don't really think about it. Yes, it's, 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 it's very difficult. It's, to, you know, to be able to do it so people don't notice people are acting. It, yeah. it, it, it is a great art. I, I remember when I was very young, I was at the Royal Academy and uh, I went to Moscow because I heard that uh, the Moscow Arts Theatre were doing Stanislavski's Three Sisters. And I remember sitting there in the theatre with the book, with the play and watching it, I think, over four nights. And I thought to myself, this is what it's really about, because these people are real. You know, you actually felt the emotion sitting in the audience. And uh, to me, that's always been the goal, you know, if one can do that. Uh, I, I, when I went to LA with, with this movie, Tucked, uh, I was amazed because we saw it in a cinema full of film people and afterwards, they were so overwhelmingly flattering. 
for that it makes you feel it's been worth the pain for people to say that you know yeah. like well you're the you're the british brando but then all the pain sort of goes away <laughs> that's a compliment that must have been great to hear that it, it really was i was uh, i was overwhelmed with the, the write-ups you know magnificent and all that sort of thing and and uh, it it uh, it doesn't do anything to one personally except to think you know um it's it's worked you know it's worked and, and the, pain, the pain was worth it well for anyone that's not aware and i know that a lot of people are tux was a film it did it come out in 2019 it's very recent oh, it's very only a year recent. or two ago isn't it it's only only oh yeah very recent um, very recent yeah, it, it, it got a, a, you know, a, a world distribution, but of course with the uh, virus, of course, that sort of stopped everything. So, um, but I think but it's, I um, it's on Netflix, which is nice. Yes, it's on Netflix. That's where I watched it. Um, mm. There are a lot of reviews on YouTube. I think what people do now for convenience is they go on to YouTube, they type in the name of the program mm -hmm. or the film that they're interested in, and they see if someone's reviewed it or if the film clips are on it, and then they just judge. I think people like a few minutes to see something, judge if they want to go ahead and watch it. And the amount of positive glowing reviews for Tucked on YouTube, just really? from again, Absolutely. yeah, um, BBC Five Live, um, Mark Kermode, who is their big um, film reviewer, he oh, gave yes. a wonderful review. And then there's so many people that have got their own channels from all over the world. And yeah. they're all giving these lovely, positive, glowing reviews because it's a film that has, it touches on so many subjects, but yes. it's, it's funny, it's heartbreaking, it's got moments of tension, it's got everything. Well, we, we, we hope so. We, um, it, it, it was, I was very proud of it. And Jamie Patterson, the director and the writer, uh, we had an, a wonderful relationship of give and take. And, uh, um, you know, I, I admired, I admired his, uh, his ability, uh, which was, um, which, which is good because a lot of, you know, when you're an actor, some of the most difficult people you've got to deal with are directors, <laughs> you know, and you think oh, if you'd only go away and just leave me alone, things would be much easier. <laughs> I can imagine because from a makeup point of view as well, and um, what you did with Jackie, I'm sure that there was some collaboration there with how the character was going to look, but oh, yeah, it's- um, the only thing was that when I was made up, I looked like my mother. <laughs> <laughs> so we all do. It doesn't matter what gender well, we all end up looking like our moms. <laughs> but I, but I tell you what, it, it, the high heels ruined my big toes. Oh no! There oh, comes yeah, a very point. Painful. <laughs> very painful. And Brighton, in winter time in Brighton, in a dress is not the best. Not the best weather. Well, that's you living your best life because all the women at some point have been out in the freezing cold wearing yes. far too. So you can now understand, you can relate. Absolutely. But mind you, the only great advantage is, you know, you can have a wee-wee so much easier. In a <laughs> You're looking for the positives. That's good. Yeah, always, always. In the freezing cold, the positives. There's always a positive to be found. Yeah, but I I hope even. So. Well, see, from the makeup point of view, so um, I am a trained makeup artist. I also teach the subject in colleges. So what you're saying about the academy, I can relate to because sometimes, again, you've got students that have got different abilities, um, oh, yes. different, different confidence levels. It might not be acting, but they might have this ability, but they can't quite get it out. Or sometimes they're not comfortable working on a client so that I, I feel sometimes that's a bit similar to acting in the sense that that's their audience and yes, they have to get comfortable with them yeah the the, the um april did the makeup you know who's jimmy jamie patterson's wife she was doing all the makeup she Mind did a you, great job. She, oh she did an amazing job but sometimes you used to sit there and you'd have to put it on then take it off to do a thing <sighs> then put it back on mm -hmm. and you go, oh my goodness me. 
one's face got a bit raw after a while. I can imagine. And that's, again, I found that so interesting that at this point in your career too, you, you were taking on a character that... Well, funnily enough, you see, I mean, I, I really don't get involved anymore because I've been doing it for so long now. Yeah. Like, anyway, so uh, Jamie uh, came up, uh, I knew him because his father was laying some carpet in one of my offices. And this young man said, oh, um, Darren, I, I want to be a film director. And I thought, oh my God, you know, dear, oh, <laughs> you know, really, well, it's very, you know, it's not easy. And then uh, I thought, what a nice guy. And then he came up to me and said, look, I've made a little film. I would really like you to have a look at it. So I thought, oh dear, dear, dear. So I thought, oh, I suppose I better go and see it. And actually I saw it and I thought, you have talent. You, you are, you can do it, young man. And then a bit later on, he said, I've written a film for you. And I thought, oh God, oh dear. And I said, what do, what do I do? Do I kill anybody? And he said, no, you play a drag queen and a crossdresser. <laughs> and I said, pardon? I do what? <laughs> and he said, well, you play a drag queen and you do a whole act and uh-huh. And so I thought, well, I better read it. Anyway, to cut a long story short, it was tucked and and we uh we did it and it was most in most most enjoyable. Oh, it was better. brilliant. And it just it's such a lovely film. I think it'll be very interesting. You know, eventually these films work their way onto um, like Sky movies and premiere, yeah. I think it's called now. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they go on to terrestrial TV. It's going to be so interesting to see when yeah. more people see it and then more again. And you yes. keep getting those waves of, well, yeah. you said about the awards that you'd won. How many awards did the film win? 14. 14, 14. We went, 14 international film awards. And when wow. we went to LA, we were sitting in this amazing cinema in Los Angeles and um, they were coming up with the, all the awards. And then we heard something like tucked and Jamie turned around to me and he said, did they just say tucked? And I said, yes. And he said, that's the penultimate. That's, I said, yes. He said, right, come on, let's get on stage. Wow. So we went on stage and took the award and we went back into the, into the old, you know, into the uh, auditorium. And then we heard the top ward. And he said, did they just say tucked? <laughs> he said, yes, again. I said, yes, we've won the top one. Oh, right, right. <laughs> so we won both top awards, which was unheard of for a, yeah. an American film, let alone a British one. And one of the critics said, the British lion roars again. Oh, see, and again, that must be extra, proud well it must be an extra proud moment for you because you've been in film in the different decades which I again oh, yeah. I think you deserve so much respect for the different decades in which you've worked in film I find this fascinating because you can educate us plus your students and I, when I say us I mean us in the podcast yeah. you've got experience of film production from the 50s yeah. onwards. There are not a lot of people that can say that. No, indeed not. No, in fact, I, I produced and directed my own film at one time, but called The Amorous Milkman, because I- Oh, yeah. and I, I've not seen that. I'm looking forward to that. Well, it's not that. all that good. It's not, a, it's not all that good because I, I, I wrote a book because I wanted to make a film and they said, well, you can't write a book and do it anyway. I did and it got published and I did the screenplay then I produced it and directed it. And uh, just because I wanted to see what it was like. Uh -huh. And uh, that was great fun. No more, I didn't want to do it again. Is it no. far more work than you could ever anticipate? Absolutely. And yeah. it's very worrying because you've got a lot of money for people, you know, and you feel responsible that you don't want to lose them their money. Too much stress. <laughs> I'm still looking forward to it though. That's the thing, when, when things are either on TV or sometimes on YouTube, I know it's not good, but sometimes people put films on YouTube. I know that's not the right thing to do, but if a film pops up that I've not seen before, yeah. I think, oh, give that a quick watch before they remove it <laughs> because it's not supposed to be. I know, but I mean, it, it, is, it is strange to be, to be as old as I am now because I did this film called Where Eagles Dare, 
Uh, I with, am yeah, very but, aware. And uh, well, there's only two of us who are still alive, and that's Clint Eastwood and me. Everybody else is dead. I mean, the all the production, all the act, they're all dead except uh, except us two. And of course, I got blinded in that film. Um, what happened? Well, it was. <laughs> well, um, I was supposed to be shot in the middle of my forehead, so they did a perfect bullet hole. And I know the scene, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then Clint Eastwood was supposed to shoot me twice, so once in the forehead and once in the chest. And so they had five jackets lined up, you know, for this thing. And so Brian Hutmer, director, a lovely, lovely man. And he said, all right, so, you know, remember that he's been shot in the chest, right? So anyway, they put the, you know, the board and the metal bit on top and two, two Durexes full of blood. <laughs> the first time that happened to me, I said to the special effects man, wait a minute, what is this? You know, so said, he said, no, no, it's best thing. And so they put a little uh, charge over them, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you stand there and Clint Eastwood goes bang, bang, and it just went beep. <laughs> and, you know, Brian Hunt said, you know, for God's sake, you know, the guy's being shot, you know, you know, I want to see beep, what's the beep? So another jacket, two more blood things. Again, beep, it went on, three jackets, four jackets, the last jacket. And he said, you know, I would say, shoot. So I'm standing there and I thought, oh, I don't like this. So I moved my head back and he goes bang, bang, and it blows a hole in my chest like oh. I'd been by a bazooka. And it went all in my eyes and blinded my eyes. And, oh. and uh, so I was taken to Denham Hospital. Oh. So I had a bandage across my eye. I had a perfect bullet hole in my forehead. <laughs> And I had all this blood in my trousers and boots. So when I walked into the A&E, you could hear blood. And they said, he's had an accident. Well, I've got a perfect bullet hole oh, in my <laughs> Anyway, so I was in the London clinic for about a week. And when I saw her again, Clint Eastwood sent me a big thing of Fortnum and Mason's fruit with a bottle of Optrex. In oh. The <laughs> That's a good sense of humour. I like that. Yeah, oh, my a, goodness. A week. Another, man, another man I did a film with called Frank Sinatra. Oh, he, Frank he, Sinatra. He was, he, he was an amazing man. And we became, uh, though I say it myself, we actually became friendly. And in fact, I'm in his book or someone wrote a book about him. But um, the reason we became friendly was that everybody wanted something from him. Because yes. at that time, he was the greatest star of all. Anyway, one of the tabloids got through to me and they said, you know, would you write um, a story or we'll ghost it, working with the biggest star in the world, I think for 15 grand or something. And I said, no, that's tacky. I'm not yeah. going to do that. No, that's tacky. Well, I think that he heard that this young actor turned down this so now I don't want anything from him. And so we, he became very friendly with me. And uh, he always asked me to lunch and... and uh, oh, that, it, that's it, no big deal, Frank Sinatra asking you to lunch. Deal. That's... <laughs> but but it, was, it was nice because we were supposed to be filming in Copenhagen. And like films happen, instead of filming in Copenhagen, they shot my stuff in Welland Garden City. Oh. And he said... <laughs> Looks like you're not going to go to Copenhagen. I said, no. He said, listen, Darren, go to Copenhagen. Have a holiday on me for 10 days. Wow. So I, said, oh, I said, no, no, that's all right. So I lived in the country at the time. I had a house that was built in 1401. And so we got to the, under the, you know, the Heathrow on his private jet and everything. Don't sit on the sofa in a private jet. <laughs> Why is that? You can't find the seat belts. <laughs> And I didn't want them to think that this is not my normal way. Yeah, you you'd know, want to look the seat belts and, confident. You know, so if that ever happens to me, I'll remember that. <laughs> you remember, yeah. Anyway, so we arrive and I'd taken out £4,000 because, you know, I'm going to be there for 10 days and uh, I wouldn't have money. Anyway, so we arrive at Copenhagen and there was one of these huge stretch limousines, very bad taste. It was awful. God. 
off of tasting things. <laughs> anyway, so a Mercedes turns up, a little man gets out. He comes over to me and he says, Mr. Sinatra welcomes you to Copenhagen. I said, that's very, very kind. And he handed me a thick manila envelope. So I got into this rather bad taste limousine with my ex-wife <laughs> and I counted it up and I said, we'll never spend, it's all money. So I can't, I said, we'll never spend this in 10 days. Now I've been known to spend money. <laughs> Have a go. <laughs> So we get taken to this amazing place, private um, lift, uh, there's kitchens, bars full of bar bedrooms, lounges. Anyway, so we go out that night, come back about four o'clock in the morning, find a bedroom, fall asleep, and something about nine o'clock is ringing. And I think, oh, where am I? Wake up, can't find the front door walk, finally find the front door, open the front door, and there's that little man from the airport. Again. Yeah, and he said, Mr. Sinatra, I hope you had a lovely evening. And I thought, oh my God, I hope he's done every morning at nine o'clock. Anyway, <laughs> he handed me, he handed me another manila envelope. Oh. Every day was a manila envelope. It wasn't that's... for ten days, it was per day. Oh, that's... That's like something from a movie. You must have been like, uh, <laughs> what's going I on? I had money everywhere, stuff everywhere. <laughs> Every That's... time I called room service, people tried to kill them. So oh they used such tips. <laughs> But it's, it's in his book. That, that story is in his book. But wow. he was a remarkable man uh, because he also asked me to, uh, I got a phone call. Uh, hi, this is Frank. Oh, pardon. Uh, I, what are you doing? He said, come over, because he used to uh, live in Grosvenor Square. Actually, next door to my best friend. Anyway, so he said, look, I'm doing a concert at Festival Hall. And, you know, you say the stupidest things. I said, yes, I know, but I can't get tickets. And you think to yourself, what a stupid thing to say. He said, I get your tickets. He said, but That's you've got to pay. You've got to pay because it's a charity. And yeah. I said, he said, well, would you be my guest at the Mirabelle, which was a, a, a beautiful London restaurant, which I used to go to, and yes. then be at Claridge's with me at, after the show. Wow. So I yeah, sat on his table at Claridge's. Anyway, but to give you an idea of the man. Now, I watched the show and it was magnificent. Yes. As I'm walking out, he's there and he turns to me and he says to this little English actor, what did you think? Now I ask you, the greatest star. Yes. And he says to a little actor, what did you think? So that shows a humility that one doesn't expect from someone like that. And so that you does. saw the real man. Uh -huh. The, the real man underneath it. And I said to him, you didn't sing the song I liked. He said, what was that? I said, all the women I know. And he sang it to me. He sang the oh, refrain. You and got your I own concert. Of, all I could think of is not many people have had a refrain sung to him. That is that's sat, fantastic. And we sat in carriages on his table. And uh, there were two blondes on either side, which he took no notice of at all. And you could eat anything. I remember looking at the menu and there was a bottle of Margot, Chateau Margot, 1,750. Then. Then, exactly. Then. So you could have whatever you wanted. Oh. Uh, in the middle of the night, he's, his pianist, there was a big piano there. And his pianist said, oh, he said, Frank, this is a beautiful piano. And Sinatra said, I can't hear it. Anyway, the two men came over because they were dressed in 17th century clothes in Claridge. <laughs> and they unscrewed the lid, took it off, and he said, yeah, play. And he played. He said, great, put it on the bill. Wow. And at I mean... about three o'clock in the morning, he said, I feel hungry. He didn't eat. Anyway, they called, I can still see it to this day, two men, waiters, dressed in 17th century clothes. And he said to them, I fancy a pizza. And they went away and I can see them coming back 
holding on a silver platter with a pizza on it between these two men. And they turned up and he said, that's a great looking pizza. And he cut a little sliver and he, <laughs> and he said, thanks. And that was it. Wow. That was it. That was it. That's, that, was it. that is a fabulous memory. That's... And I tell you what, also, when I was sitting there, while some people were from Hollywood, you know, you couldn't talk because it was... It was Mm -hmm. But something that should never be forgotten about Dean Martin. Oh, Dean they Martin. Tell the story. They tell the story and they said, Frank, do you remember that day? So I know it's true. And they were all sitting in a bar. That's Joey Bishop and the whole Rat Pack. Anyway, an old man came over to Sinatra and said, why did you leave your first wife? And he went to hit him with a beer mug. And one of Sinatra's friends hit this old man too hard. He oh. really hit him and he went down bleeding on the floor. Oh. The whole Rat Pack left except Joey Bishop and Dean Martin. And the police rush in and they look at this man lying on the floor bleeding at the bar and they turn to Dean Martin. They say, hey, who's he? And Dean Martin looked at his watch and he said, I don't know. I thought it was me, but it's a bit early. Now that should not be forgotten. That's a true story. So he That's was just story. that. Yes. So that wasn't an act. He really was no. that no, kind he, of he's guy. He's not going to move. He's not going to move. He's drinking. He's not going to move. That's. But all these people that you're talking about. So I'm in my forties, and I have my family is so aware of all these people. And I think if anyone isn't aware that's listening to the podcast I think you'd agree with me they should really seek these people out because Frank Sinatra an icon Dean Martin oh, like yeah, you say the rap Dean pack Martin, but Dean Martin sounded the the funniest of men you know I can't re remember all the stories but he really sounded the funniest of men but just Sinatra, naturally and of course Sinatra would only do two takes do you know it's funny you say that I think I've seen you know sometimes they'll put um documentaries on yeah. and it'll be there was a Sinatra documentary I think again during lockdown and it was like a four-parter and each part was a good hour maybe even more mm -hmm. and I think they mentioned that is that Only because he brought his best or is it because he felt you would get too tired or? Well, well, it, I'm the same actually because uh -huh. I like two takes and on tucked most of it was done on one take the first really time. because the first time you do it it's alive and it's vibrant and it's real and things happen that may not necessarily be in the script yes so you get that instantaneous um, result you know i always used to say shoot the rehearsal uh, because it's it's you, you get that that shimmering reality. Mm -hmm. and also, Tony Curtis was the same. Two takes. Well, that I again. Said, well, the, I said it was the Curtis. persuaders, wasn't it? You worked with them. Yeah. And I asked him. I said, because he, you know, two takes, and uh, he said, you you do two takes too, Darren. And I said, well, yeah, if I can. And he, I said, but. You did a film with Marilyn Monroe. That, that, that's it was 75 takes in a scene. And he said, oh, he said, Jesus Christ, that woman. He oh. said, five takes, all I could think of was eating rump steak. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot to be said for what you think might be the dream job. Might yeah. not. <laughs> but you that also... the favourite. Oh, again, it's, it's just from our point of view. It's fabulous to hear these things because what you were saying about two takes, I would love to know, um, last year, Special Branch was on and I really enjoyed that. I could oh, see God. I could see where that show led in inspiring shows that then came after yes, it. I could, yes. see, could see the link. And yeah. I might be wrong, but from what I've read about that, time when you were filming because television production was still relatively new as in I'm quite interested in the history of television and from what I gather it was really sort of mid to late 60s that Thames came in and they really started yeah. 
produce yeah. something. So were you under pressure to get those scenes done in one take as, as much as you could? I mean, yeah, there was always pressure. I mean, when I did The Adventures of Sir Lancelot, uh, uh, that, that was on too. an episode every five days. And of course, that meant pretty, pretty fast going. Um, I, I never felt that particularly um, uh, under under pressure, but I only did, I think, two series of Special Branch. Because, they were you know, good, they, honestly, people, I was hooked. People, people go on forever doing a series. You know? But it just goes to show um, that was a brilliant show. And again, I might be wrong because um, it, it might just be how good you all were at making it look so real. But it looked like you and Fulton Mackay had a real chemistry. We did. We absolutely did. And also there was a man called George Markstein. Yes. Who, uh, who was the sort of the, the man behind The Prisoner, which is again another story. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, he was the script editor and basically the, the man. And so you had a wonderful relationship with him. And, you know, because I said, you know, I, I've this this woman spy. I mean, she's been so clever. Can't I go to bed with her and then arrest her? <laughs> <laughs> He said, that's a good idea. <laughs> so we had this wonderful rapport between him and I and Fulton. You know, we're, I'd sit there with Fulton and we'd look at it, and, you know, he'd do his bit and he'd say, what do you think? And I'd say, yeah, 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 it's good, it's good. And then I'd do my bit and i think, what do you think? And he said, yeah, I believe it, I believe it. See, and again... I think because it's still fresh in my memory, because it was only on last year, I noticed a few episodes where right at the end, you were both uh, just finishing off the scene and it looked as if, if they'd have kept it a second longer, we would have watched you burst into giggles. That's what it looked like, as if you were just... Um, it, we, I mean, we tried to get the producer to show more of a private life. It, I they think it, it. They wouldn't do it. I think what you, maybe what you did just naturally, it just felt as if I saw little moments of humour. Like, again, it's only because it's fresh for me, just freshly watching it. Um, there was an episode where you were cooking a chicken and you answered the door in a little penny. <laughs> and oh, I yeah. thought, that's, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, funnily enough, what I actually, what I wanted was one of those ones where the woman is in a bikini, you know, with, you know <laughs> but the producer wouldn't have it. Is that you know, the limit? <laughs> Open the door, and there he is. And, and, and this, I think it was a naked woman, I think, even so. But Pushing or, it. <laughs> I, think, I think just bra and panties. And I that's thought that funny. would be hilarious, but it was a serious scene. But yeah. that, that's the thing. I just think it was so well done that, I, maybe again, it's just because I really love that era of television. I think, I think that that era is far more clever. People tend to be a bit snobbish about television now, and it's very slick. And I love television now, but I don't think we should underestimate how clever it was then, because everything was new, and everything was pushing the boundaries. And I think it was so clever how you all. It was almost like you were putting a, a fusion of theatre and television. It was it was very clever. In a way, too, because I mean, I, I brought into it because what it used to happen is, uh, technically speaking, you used to sit around and do a read through and then you'd act it out in a room mm -hmm. and then you'd go to the studio. Um, you'd act it out and then shoot. And I used to say, well, why do we need to rehearse for a week? Mm -hmm. Let's do it like a film. Yeah. Uh huh. And they brought, they slowly brought that in because it was the obvious thing to do. Because you were saying, you know, like the theater, they still felt it was like a, a theater. Yeah. Rehearsing for a week in a room. And you thought, well, why? Because we go on the set at the end of the week, we rehearse the scene and we shoot it. Well, why don't, you know, why bother for a whole week yeah. rehearsing? When, when you can just do it uh, as you do a film. And like you say, keep it fresh, yeah. Oh, well, um, fresh. I just want to say hats off to you for that. And again, we, we just touched on 
where he goes there, but wow, what a film. And you know that a lot of people, you, you must get this all the time, people must still be shocked to hear that you're not German. <laughs> Does that still happen? No, that's very true, because when I first met Frank Sinatra, uh -huh. uh, when I just got the part, uh, I, he said, uh, hiya, Darren. And I say, how do you do? How, how do you do, Mr. Sinatra? He said, you're not a kraut. I said, no, <laughs> I'm an Englishman. He said, I thought you were a kraut. I said, no, no, I mean, it's you to a crap in my film. I said, yes, so I believe. <laughs> That's, oh yeah, well, I I'm, I think I've got the Sinatra film to watch. I'm sure I've got that. I got a few DVDs last year. As I say, there were so many things that you were in that we agreed as a family. We said, right, what are we going to look for? What are we going to watch? So there's a few films that I've got ready to watch and I'm sure that's one of them. So do you think that's, uh, I'm going to enjoy that when I see it? Is that I a good mean, one? I hope so. I hope so. Oh, well, I can't wait. And I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I've got a few questions. Sure. Some of these, they might be like, all right, you might know this or you might not. So I actually wrote these down. Right. So when you were in The Prisoner, yes. um, again, that was a great character. It was quite off the wall. Well, shall I now, tell you what happened? Oh, yeah, please do. Well, I was going to be the permanent number two. Ah. There weren't going to be any more number twos. It was just going to be one number two and of course George Mark Stein who was the creator of The Prisoner he said you know Darren we'd like you to play the permanent number two and I said yeah that'd be fine anyway McGowan wouldn't have it he wouldn't he wouldn't have the competition because mm. I'd done Danger Man with him and all the rest of it and so I, anyway Mark Stein said he won't have you now I was with the grade organization then who put up all the money right. uh, who actually were friends of my family and he said, well, anyway, would you do special branch for me? And I said, yeah, I'll do special branch. And so uh, the episode that I was in was actually going to be the one that introduced the permanent number two. And George Markstein said, what are we going to do? Where do all these number twos come from? Where do they all go? I mean, all got number twos coming everywhere. Anyway, so Asher, who was the director of that particular episode, he came into my dressing room and he said, hi, Darren, we've never worked before. I said, no. He said, I, maybe I shouldn't say this. Do you know what this is all about? I said, I have no idea what this is about. He said, well, they said I can go and look at the first episode and they'll tell me, that'll tell me what it's all about. Have another breakfast. So anyway, I had another breakfast. And I'm sitting in the dressing room, knock on the door and Asher comes in. I said, well, do you know what it's about? He said, I've got no idea what it's about. So as you note in the character that I played, I played him like he didn't know what on earth was going on all around him. Anyway, McGowan started, he said, well, you're playing it for laughs. You, you look like you don't know what's going on. I said, you don't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on. The entire crew don't know what's going on. And if you think I'm going to play someone who knows what's going on when he doesn't know what's going on, go eat yourself. <laughs> <laughs> or words to those. <laughs> or words to those. But, uh, but, but that's the story of the... Uh, oh, that's of, of hilarious. The, yeah. I thought you played that really well because you captured it. It's almost as if you were the missing link between what we were watching and what was actually happening. So I felt as if you were almost like our interpreter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, I'm pleased But um, I did read something, you might know this or you might think it's absolute rubbish, but apparently yeah. the Thunderbirds puppets, have you heard this yeah. before? Yes, so you did. So Sean Connery was the inspiration for Scott Tracy Adam Faith and Charlton Heston for John Tracy, and you were the inspiration for Alan Tracy. Have you heard that? No, no. And I do you know so. if that's true? No, it is true. That's because, amazing. Because I went, I I went to Anderson, you know, Anderson uh -huh. and I said to him, excuse, I said, wait a minute, I I forget the name of the doll, the puppet. I said, I think you're Alan that, Tracy. Alan, I said this, Alan is that supposed to be me? And he looked at me and he nodded and laughed. I said, does that, do I act like that? You know, it's true. But it's true. It's what a compliment. 
because mm. I didn't know if you were aware or if you'd say how dare you but I, I would think that's no, brilliant no, if I was no. a puppet no I just said is that me and he just laughed and nodded that what an absolute accolade to be a thunderbird <laughs> that's fabulous because i also read that um sharon tate the american actress she was the inspiration for malibu barbie because she was in um don't make waves with tony curtis but she was called she was a character called malibu so they never actually said that the barbie doll was her they just called it malibu barbie so you're in good company you're in very yes, good company good. But um, so you just got a nod. You didn't get anything other than that. You didn't get no, your just own. A nod, just, a nod. <laughs> just a nod. And then um, some other things, again, just from a makeup point of view, because being a makeup artist, back in those days, would they bleached your hair quite a few times? Oh, yes. That's not a comfortable thing to go no. through. In fact, when I was doing Where Eagles There, it was peroxide. Wow. And then it was peroxide for years. And then I went to Rome and they said, oh, we don't want peroxide, we want black hair. So I sat with two mad <laughs> Italian hairdressers who went bananas on my hair. And they said, well, we've got to stop because all your hair is going to fall out. And it turned yeah. green. <laughs> now, it was green when it wasn't fashionable to be green. No. And so I had to buy a hat. And every time I went into a restaurant, they sat me by the lavatories. <laughs> <laughs> and so they finally, finally got it to be black without it all falling out. So you were trailblazing for the punks, basically. Just yeah, absolutely. A bit ahead. <laughs> absolutely. Did you see that actor with green hair sitting by the lavatories? And uh, <laughs> that, that's a nice thought. Well, and again, purely because it was on TV last year, um, in The Protectors, I believe it was, they had you dressed up as a granny. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I remember that now, yes. That I was only... Yeah, that them. was funny. Again, that was only... I, I noticed last year they, they repeated these quite a lot. So I was just watching them every morning. I just had the TV on in the morning. I was like, right, what are we watching today? Let's watch The Protectors. And you popped up a few times and I thought, oh, you must have a good sense of humour because they had you in your little head scarf and then all sorts. So I thought you must have a good sense of humour to, <laughs> to just go for it with your, your characters. There was another film called Ooh, You Are Awful. Yeah, that was on at the weekend. Which was good fun. And again, I got dressed up in, in that. And I got covered, I remember, in eggs for at some time or other. Something blew up and I got covered in <laughs> eggs, I remember. And Dick Emery must have been, I'm imagining that he would have been really, again, like the level to get, to get the humour must have been quite hard work doing a film like that, because they do say it's quite, quite labour intensive to do something funny. Well, yes, I mean, you've got to be very serious to do something uh -huh. funny. But my family were very, very famous in music hall. In fact, I was born in a theatre. And of course, Dick Emery uh, wow. knew my family. So, and that's how I knew the grade organisation. You know, Lou Grade and Leslie Grade were friends wow. of my family. What a fabulous, um, obviously you were destined to be in this industry, clearly. Yeah, I, 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 I think so, because I mean, sort of being born in the theatre, I don't think I was actually born in the theatre. That's I think, amazing. I think I started off at the Finsbury Park Empire, and I think <laughs> I finished off in, in, in a hospital nearby. But I mean, my mother was very, very friendly with, with um, grade, you know, in 1930s and 1940s, she was very front friendly with with the with grade, but my father then, if he was my father, I'm not even sure if he was, but he <laughs> was the biggest star in the world in in London then, you uh -huh. know, in 1928, and so I think she sort of moved more towards the finance uh, than uh, than Mr. Grade, who wasn't who was a a, a tap dancer at the time he turned wow. out to be quite famous <laughs> just yeah. a little i mean the wow you there's an autobiography here if ever honestly well, i've i've actually been uh, sort of bullied into writing it and yes. I, I, i'm not sure i think it's going to be published i don't know oh i, I self-publishing nowadays you can make it happen well i think it's i think there's a publisher I, one of the problems is that most of the women are still alive. 
change their names ever so slightly. And <laughs> well, yes, I've done that. <laughs> well, there but you go. A... <laughs> but I, I just... mean, there was one, there was one, you know, um, Joan Collins's sister. We were at uh, drama school together. She was quite a girl. Oh, she was quite I, a girl. I know. I just, again, from what you're saying, that entire era, I just think that your age group has done so much that is trickling down still to this day. It's still trickling down. You've opened doors, you've pushed boundaries. I just, I think there's more people than you realize of all age groups that are still learning from what your demographic did. We're still learning and we're still appreciative of it. It's, 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 it's very, um, it, it's very rewarding. I never thought so, but you know, it's, uh, you know, for instance, you know, like yourself watching talking pictures. And in those days, you know, it was just, you know, one job after another and you weren't really aware that you were giving pleasure. And yeah. um, it gives me great pleasure to think that anyone gets pleasure from seeing them again. Oh, we definitely do. I think that is, you've actually rounded it off beautifully. That's such a nice way to leave it. Um, I just want to remind everyone of the New Era Academy. I think what you're doing there is so important and it does sound again, I don't think you intend it, but you always seem to be trailblazing. You always seem to be at the front and then someone else is saying, oh, that's quite interesting. We'll see if we can do that. So would you Very recommend... Fun. Do you think if anyone's got youngsters that are interested in developing their acting skills, just look at the New Era Academy website? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, they go to a teacher and and we have all the, the syllabus or syllabi and uh -huh. all the different, you know, how to do it and how the exams go and everything. And um, it's, um, well, I, I love it, but my... Miranda is amazing. She is a dynamic woman. I think, do you know, that is the perfect place to thank Miranda because if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be talking today because she helped me out when I couldn't get my emails to work. So thank you, Darren, and thank you, Miranda. She helped, she helped. She's amazing. It's been my pleasure. It's been great fun. Oh, Darren, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't that a fascinating chat? Darren's got so many wonderful stories about these iconic names from modern film and his memory for anything that I asked him regarding filming or little points that I've noticed in programmes and films that he's been in that I've just been watching recently, he was able to answer everything. So from a creative point of view and for answering those questions for me, Darren, thank you so much. If you'd like to know more about New Era Academy and what they do, then you can visit the website, which is neweraacademy.co.uk. And remember, they're not just based in the UK. So no matter where you are in the world, you can check them out for more information. Thanks again to Miranda, because she really did help when we had a few little technical hiccups. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'm always happy to hear your thoughts. Have a great day and I'll see you again soon.